They were the all-American family, a young doctor popular and well-liked in his small, quiet community, a beautiful wife, a seven-year-old son, and a baby on the way. Their sprawling home perched just above the lake with a beach below. A beautiful home, a growing family, a successful medical practice, and it just overnight disappeared. Disappeared in a rage-filled, cold-blooded murder. Inside the Shepherd family home, the doctor's wife, 31-year-old Marilyn Shepherd, was dead. Savagely beaten, partially clothed, laying in a pool of blood on her bed. There was rage. There was rage in that 27 blows to her head. The crime scene was horrific, but also suspicious. They felt that the crime scene was staged to have three possible false motives. Who would have wanted Marilyn Shepard dead? Was it an enraged husband? An infatuated handyman? Was the mayor involved? For more than 65 years, the debate has raged on. There's no question, though, that whether you call it passion or rage, this is not something that someone simply says, I'm going to murder this person and take the jewelry. There's something more to it. Three trials over nearly five decades with three different outcomes. And it left people wondering who was right, who was wrong, who committed the murder, and who didn't. I'm Nicole Versansky, and this is Dark Side of the Land. I grew up hearing whispers about the infamous Sam Shepard case. My grandfather was the first Cleveland homicide detective on the scene. I was a little girl when he passed, and I always wished I could have asked him more about it. Seeing his signature on the original police report gave me goosebumps. Police In this podcast, we dig into the evidence with the Shepard family attorney and with the prosecutor the from the 2000 civil trial. We go behind the scenes and into the room where all of the evidence and case files, more than 60 boxes, is now being held. Do you think the answer of who killed Marilyn Shepard is in one of these boxes? I do. It was July 1954. Dwight Eisenhower was president. Elvis Presley was beginning his rise to fame. Construction for Disneyland was about to begin. And in the quiet little lakefront community of Bay Village, Ohio, families were getting ready for picnics and parades, celebrating Independence Day. But inside the home of one of the town's beloved doctors, the daylight on July 4th would reveal a gruesome murder scene. 31-year-old Marilyn Shepard brutally beaten in her bedroom. At least 27 blows to the face with a heavy object. She was lying in her bed, partially undressed in a pool of blood. Her seven-year-old son, Chip, asleep in the next room. Her husband, Dr. Sam Shepard, told police he too had been attacked. He was jolted awake by Marilyn's screams sometime in the early morning hours. Here's an account of Dr. Shepard's story from the WOIO TV files. I jumped off the couch and ran upstairs. I thought I saw a white form standing in our bedroom. Then I think I was struck from behind. Sam had fallen asleep downstairs the night before. The Shepherds had just hosted a dinner party. They drank, had a good time, and even before his guests left, Dr. Shepherd fell asleep on a couch, right by the stairs to the second floor. I believe it was sometime after 12.30 a.m. I had fallen asleep on the living room couch. I think she asked me to come up to bed. The next thing I knew, Marilyn was screaming or moaning my name. I jumped off the couch and ran upstairs. I thought I saw a white form standing in our bedroom. Then I think I was struck from behind and knocked out. When I came to, I went over to where Marilyn was. I felt she was gone. I believe I then rushed into our son Chip's room. After seeing him, I came to the conclusion he was unharmed. The shepherd's home appeared ransacked. 
Drawers pulled out of an office desk, a doctor's bag on the floor, its contents scattered all around. But there was no sign of forced entry. Neighbors didn't even hear the dog bark. Had an intruder just brutally murdered Marilyn Shepard? Or was this a twisted tale of lies to cover up that Sam Shepard was the killer? Dr. Shepard refused to take a lie detector test. And soon, details of a strained relationship started to surface. Marilyn was talking about divorcing Sam. He had discussed it with one of the other doctors at the hospital. That was the week before. Marilyn wanted a divorce, and Dr. Shepard was having an affair with a 24-year-old lab technician who worked with him at Bayview Hospital. So on the Friday night, while he may have been getting along well that night with his wife and his guests, something made those emotions explode into what they turned into in a bloody homicide. The evidence convinced one jury that Dr. Shepard was guilty. Ten years later, a new trial and a new jury would set Dr. Shepard free. And after that, a third jury in a civil trial would once again cast doubt on the doctor's innocence. Just like these odd things about the evidence that lead you to one conclusion. Bill Mason was the Cuyahoga County prosecutor for the 2000 civil trial. He believes Sam Shepard murdered his wife. Mason spent years researching and carefully dissecting the doctor's story, finding the holes and finding the motive for murder. They had just learned that Marilyn was pregnant with another child. Sam didn't want another child. In fact, he had stoked with some of the people, doctors at the hospital saying, upset that his wife was pregnant. As a doctor, Sam was often on call for medical emergencies. There was one such emergency in the hours leading up to Marilyn's death. One that hit close to home. The afternoon before, uh, Sam was in surgery with uh, working at his hospital and a, a young boy, kind of the age of uh, Chip Shepard, was killed in an accident and ended up dying on the bed. So he was upset that day coming home and that evening he had a, a dinner party with a couple friends, the Aherns. They were drinking and enjoying themselves. Sam fell asleep on this couch at around 12.30 that night and the Aherns left, Marilyn went up to bed. My theory is that around four o'clock in the morning, Sam had awakened, went up to his wife's bed, expecting to have a relation with her. She rejected him and he lost it. All those pent up emotions mixed with a night of drinking and Mason says Sam just exploded. There was rage. There was rage in that 27 blows to her head. Mason says the crime scene in the bedroom showed no signs of any struggle between Dr. Shepard and an intruder. You would expect if somebody was bleeding that there would just be this massive amount of blood from a struggle that he describes up in the bedroom. It would be like on the walls and on the floor and on the bed. There's not. Sam Shepard said he chased the suspect outside and struggled again with him on the beach just below the house. But Mason says there was no sign of a struggle there either. What was discovered on the beach in some bushes was a green cloth bag. It looked like it could have been for a liquor bottle. Inside that bag was Dr. Shepard's watch. Marilyn's blood was on it. The watch, the watch that Sam was wearing that night and the blood spat, Marilyn's blood spatter on the watch indicate that that watch was within two feet of the blood flying from Marilyn's head. So that's the biggest piece of evidence that I don't think anybody could get around. Uh, there's no sign of forced entry into the home. Uh, Sam wasn't wearing a t-shirt that night that would have had the blood stains on it. It was disappeared. The murder weapon also disappeared, and whatever that heavy object was was never identified, never found. But Mason points to a lamp missing from the shepherd's bedroom. Uh, we know from a witness who repaired the, the lamp uh, a couple weeks before the homicide who brought it back and put it on the nightstand in the bedroom um, that there was a lamp that was supposed to be there, and there was never a lamp found to this day. We know that it was a heavy blunt instrument that struck her in the head 27 times. So we looked at the, the evidence we had and the pillow of where she was laying had this little impression of looks like the harp of a lamp. And uh, we went up and down Clark Avenue in the antique warehouse looking for a harp to fit the lamp and found one. And so it's as good as a theory as there is, is that after beating her, he set that lamp down on the the pillow and it put that impression on the pillow and then you know did whatever else they were doing to clean up the house 
The coroner believed Marilyn Shepard died between 3 and 4.45 in the morning on July 4th. Sam's first call for help was at 5.40 a.m., at least one hour later. Was Dr. Shepard unconscious, or was that perhaps enough time for a cleanup? Well, there wasn't any fingerprints anywhere in the house. The house was wiped down by somebody. There was no fingerprints anywhere on the drawers, on the rails, on the walls. So somebody cleaned it up. Mason says the crime scene just simply didn't match the doctor's story. Well, it would have looked different. I mean, certainly um, the murder scene up in the bedroom would have had blood smeared on the walls from from a fight. There would have been the drawers that were pulled out and... uh, in the living room just dumped over with no fingerprints on them. Those would have had fingerprints on them. They looked like they were wiped down and maybe a crime scene was created by the doctor and maybe his brothers. Dr. Shepard's first call for help after finding his wife dead and brutally beaten was to the mayor. He doesn't call the police. He doesn't call the uh, fire department for an ambulance. He calls his next door neighbor, the mayor. Sam Shepard was found guilty in the first trial in 1954. He was sentenced to life in prison. But many people feel the verdict was heavily influenced by the media circus that surrounded it. The state says that his motive for murder was his love for another woman, that he wanted to get rid of his wife. I've been asked by friends who he really looks like, and I say that in profile he greatly resembles Marlon Brando, And in full faith, he reminds me of Henry Fonda. Newspapers with headlines like, why isn't Sam Shepard in jail and getting away with murder? The U.S. Supreme Court called it a a circus, a Roman holiday, a mockery because of the sensational news coverage that was very biased, tainted the jury pool. Was there a rush to judgment? Had an innocent man been sent to prison? They've got no weapon. They've got nothing on my hands or my eyebrows or my hair, no blood anywhere, nothing on my clothes. How could I be guilty? Sam Shepard expresses his outrage at the conviction. Was Marilyn's killer still out there? I'm Nicole Versansky, and this is Dark Side of the Land. Dr. Sam Shepard continued to argue his innocence from prison as he served a life sentence for the murder of his wife. I was in the house when Marilyn was killed. That's the only thing that they've got. They've got no weapon. They've got nothing on my hands or my eyebrows or my hair, no blood anywhere, nothing on my clothes. How could I be guilty? Ten years into that sentence, Dr. Shepard was granted a new trial with help from an aspiring young criminal attorney, F. Lee Bailey, the same lawyer who would later help acquit O.J. Simpson. My reaction is that the system has paid off. This was a criminal charge. The defendant has been found not guilty, and I think that's what he should have been found. Sam Shepard was exonerated in 1967. Listen to his words on being released from prison. It was hell. Bailey's theory on the murder was a love triangle with Marilyn Shepard, the Bay Village mayor, and his wife. His story was that Esther Huck killed Marilyn in a jealous fit of rage, and her husband, John Spencer Huck, helped with the cover-up. The couple was never charged, but it did leave enough doubt in a jury's mind to set Sam Shepard free. It took over 10 years to get that new trial, and when he had a fair trial, the jury had no problem finding him not guilty. But the real Terry Gilbert was the Shepard family attorney for the 2000 civil trial. Dr. Shepard died in 1970. He basically drank himself to death. His son Chip, now known as Sam Shepard Jr., wanted to clear his father's name and show he was wrongfully imprisoned. They have another theory on who killed Marilyn. It was not Dr. Shepard who killed his wife. To convince someone that it wasn't Dr. Shepard, you have to give them another logical explanation. Obviously, someone killed Marilyn. You know, if it wasn't Dr. Shepard, then who? Right. That who, Gilbert believes, was the Shepard's handyman, Richard Eberling. He owned a company called Dick's Window Cleaning. Marilyn hired him to work around the house, and sometimes he'd come in for a snack and chat with Marilyn and Chip. He would have been 25 when Marilyn was murdered. 
Richard Eberling, a very troubled young man at, when he was a child, was in and out of mental institutions, was diagnosed as a sociopath. He killed other people, other women, one of whom was, it was very similar to the Shepherd murder. Eberling died in prison in 1989, serving a life sentence for the murder of Ethel Durkin, an elderly widow who Eberling worked for as a nurse's aide. What's bizarre is that Durkin's sister was also murdered back in 1962. Eberling was suspected but never charged. The woman was found in her bed, brutally beaten, hit repeatedly in the face. No weapon found, no obvious break-in, and the crime happened sometime in the overnight hours. Eerily similar to the details surrounding Marilyn Shepard's murder. We did have experts that said that Richard Arperling was a viable suspect, and it's likely that his DNA profile was in the house at the time of the murder. Uh, we found a blood spot on the wall that had a third party's DNA, and that became a huge factor in showing that Richard Eberling could be the likely uh, suspect, along with the wood chips from the steps that showed that it was a blood of a third party and likely Richard Eberling. Gilbert had a nationally known DNA expert from Indianapolis looking over that DNA in the late 90s. Results did not conclusively find it was Eberling's DNA. They just didn't rule him out. But why? Why would a young handyman want to kill Marilyn Shepard? Eberling was fascinated by Marilyn. He made comments about her California style of living and that he was jealous of Dr. Shepard for having such a beautiful wife and envied their lifestyle. It was a way of denying him his life. It was a sick kind of movement on the part of Eberling to destroy Dr. Shepard. There was also that strange scar on Eberling's left wrist. An expert suggested that it was in the course of Marilyn biting him because a one or two teeth were found in the bedroom and the only way those teeth could come out is it with a bite. If it was from the blows, these remnants of the teeth would have gone into her mouth. So that was another theory we looked at. Eberling did pass a lie detector test after the murder. He told detectives he was at his Westlake home about five minutes from the Shepherds with guests the night of July 3rd, 1954. Then at church with his mom that July 4th morning. Eberling actually took the stand in the second trial when Dr. Shepard was acquitted. I wanted to ask Prosecutor Bill Mason about that. Ethley Bailey had him take the stand in the second trial. Is it odd to you that perhaps Sam Shepard wouldn't say, wait a second, he looks familiar? <laughs> yeah, like that's the guy I fought with on the beach and that's the guy that knocked me out in the house, yes. The jury in the 2000 civil case ultimately didn't buy the Eberling theory, finding that Dr. Shepard was not wrongfully imprisoned. Three trials, three different outcomes and questions still remain. Yeah, we can open it. All of the case files and all of the evidence now neatly labeled and stacked in boxes, at least 60 of them, in a small room tucked into the law library at the Cleveland Marshall College of Law. I went there for a closer look and to talk with Dean Lee Fisher and the two librarians, Lisa Smilnack and Beth Farrell, who have meticulously gone over nearly every piece of evidence in the case. I'm sure it was never found. Their footnotes are intriguing. There was a lamp in the room. If you remember, the night before the murder, Sam fell asleep on that couch on the first floor, right next to the only set of stairs leading to the second floor and Marilyn's bedroom. I think one of the hardest things to explain is why someone who's going to murder Marilyn would walk by Sam Shepard. He was not a small man. Just by looking at him, uh, you'd be concerned that if he woke up, he could actually hurt you. He was a big guy, he turned out to be a wrestler later on in his life. So you'd think twice about even going upstairs. And then when you do go upstairs, 
if the intent is to murder somebody, you do it quickly so that you don't get caught. You don't start rifling through other things, right? Mm -hmm. Or if your motive is burglary, you do that quickly uh, and don't wake up Marilyn. Uh, so either way, it, it stretches credibility that someone would go upstairs and take the risk of being caught by spending a lot of time uh, by engaging in a murder where literally she's repeatedly hit and it's a crime of passion or a crime of rage. Now, is it possible that someone else had motives for that rage? Yes, it is possible. Uh, but I think, for me, the hardest thing to explain is why the intruder would go past Sam Shepard to begin with. A report from an FBI analyst who'd been studying crime scenes for 25 years was pretty interesting to them, too, according to our conversation. They felt that the crime scene was staged to have three possible false motives. One was that it was a robbery for profit. One was that it was a rape or crime of passion. And the other one that it was somebody trying to steal drugs out of Sam Shepard's medical bag. They, they felt that none of those things were very persuasive and that when amateurs stage a crime scene, it looks like something that would be on the television or a movie because they're not real criminals. And when you talk about staging the crime scene, we have specific photos. Describe what you mean by things just didn't seem like a crime scene, a desk. The desk drawers were pulled out of the desk, but neatly stacked to the side. Whereas if you were just rifling through a desk, you'd be pulling that desk drawer out and throwing it wherever it landed. And the doctor's bag was tipped over and Sam claimed that two types of drugs were missing. But a burglar looking for drugs is probably not going to take the time to look through the bag for the specific drugs. They'll just take the whole bag. There was cash stolen from Sam's wallet, he claimed. Why wouldn't they just take the whole wallet? But what about Richard Eberling? What about his blood potentially being in a hall around wood chips outside by the porch? Wasn't there a theory that perhaps that he had cut him, that Eberling had cut himself while washing windows and that could have been, there, that there was some, that could have been an explanation for his blood being on the porch. But I think one of the most persuasive things to me was when we were gifted the collection from the prosecutor's office, someone came in and said, when we started looking at the case, we didn't assume that Sam was guilty. We looked at it with a fresh eye. In fact, many people on the prosecutor's team thought he was innocent because what they had seen was the fugitive. The Fugitive was the TV series in the 60s and then the movie in the 90s said to be heavily influenced by the Shepard case. A doctor wrongfully convicted of murder on the run from authorities. So based on their study of all of the uh, evidence that was collected, they came to believe that Sam was guilty. From everything I've seen, it seems, you know, the phrase Occam's razor, which is the simplest explanation, is usually the true one. And it just seems that much simpler that the person who lived in the home and with her actually did it. And I think there was enough evidence to show that. And was there evidence, too, that Dr. Shepard actually confessed to the crime? A bizarre story in the months just before his death. A handwritten note, one word in particular, inside a book in a beauty salon. The book was Endure and Conquer, written by Dr. Shepard. He lived near Columbus at the time and was dating a woman named Sharon. The two were at a bleaching party hosted by Phyllis Moretti at her hair salon. It was a small group of people drinking champagne, having fun as the women bleached their hair blonde. The owner, Phyllis, handed that book, Endure and Conquer, to Dr. Shepard for an autograph. But inside it, he writes in the book, it was a question, did Sam do it? He writes in there, yes. And then the next page signs his name to Phyllis Moretti, best wishes. Mm -hmm. Just weird stuff. Like, why, Bill Mason took that yes, penned in blue on page one, very seriously in the 2000 civil trial. And we had the ink tested on the pages, make sure they were consistent, they were the same ink, and that they were in circulation at the time in 1954. That You could do that through the Department of Treasury. They track, if you believe it, they track all ink. And they did a, uh, a handwriting 
sample of his writings and this writings, and our expert says, yeah, that's just one and the same. Was it a confession? Was it just a strange joke? This was around the same time Dr. Shepard became a professional wrestler with the stage name Killer Sam Shepard. It was a short-lived career he would die six months later, April 6, 1970. He was just 46 years old. It's an American tragedy. That's how the Shepard attorney, Terry Gilbert, ultimately describes the Sam Shepard story. He was a mess when he got out. He, he, he didn't even get along with his son. And he died a broken man. And even after Dr. Shepard's death, the jury is, in many ways, still out. And the debate rages on. It's not so much that I think that Sam Shepard was a saint. I don't think he was, based upon what I've heard about him over the years. We have a system based upon reasonable doubt. And I believe that the fact that there was at least one person who certainly could have done it and had the circumstances and potential motive, I don't know, that enough to me is to cause some doubt as to whether or not Sam Shepard actually committed the murder. The Sam Shepard case files at Cleveland Marshall College of Law have been downloaded more than 225,000 times. 7,000 institutions, people from nearly every country in the world, every state in the United States have tapped into the online resource, perhaps searching for their own answer to who killed Marilyn Shepard. There's an old saying that if you change the way you look at things, the things that you look at change. So I'm all for looking at this evidence in a whole new way. And sometimes, Dean Fisher says, the truth is hidden in plain sight. For Dark Side of the Land, I'm Nicole Versansky. A special thanks to the Cleveland Marshall College of Law at Cleveland State University for providing some of the audio clips you heard in this podcast. Subscribe now for future episodes and find more Dark Side of the Land and photo galleries related to these cases at cleveland19.com.